You're listening to Voices of Customer Experience. I'm your host, Mary Drummond, and on this podcast, we shine the spotlight on individuals who are making a difference in customer experience. We also proudly bring you the very best of customer experience, behavior economics, data analytics, and design. Make sure to subscribe or follow us on social for updates. Voices of Customer Experience is brought to you by Worthix. Discover your worth at worthix.com. Today, I'm excited to bring one of my favorite people in CX to the show, Nate Brown. Nate is the co-founder of CX Accelerator. While customer service is his primary expertise, Nate is able to leverage experience in professional services, marketing, and sales to connect the dots and solve big problems. From authoring and leading a customer experience program to journey mapping and managing a complex contact center, Nate is always learning new things first and sharing with the CX community. Follow him on Twitter using the handle at customer is first. Nate, I'm so glad to have you on today. Me as well. My pleasure. And thank you. Awesome. Well, you know what? You're kind of, I think that at this point, you've become kind of a legend in the CX sphere um, with all of the projects and work that you've done. I know people, you know, love you and love what you're doing. But um, for those who are totally out of the loop and don't know about you, would you mind giving just like an intro telling people who you are, what your passion is, what your mission is for customer experience. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for that that motivating (laughs) intro. I think I feel quite oversold, but thank you. Uh, So I am Nate and I manage a contact center customer service background. And over the past few years have really been delving into this concept of customer experience and ultimately making that evolution, that trans transition from customer service into a true CX strategy type of role and doing that not only in my quote unquote day job, but also on the thought leadership level and going from managing customer centric support as a blog to now CX Accelerator and really trying to learn and fuel and equip CX professionals o- across the world. So tell me about CX Accelerator since you brought it up. Sure. So it is a passion project. It is a Slack, a virtual community on Slack, and it's got about 450 folks in there. So it's small, but it's it's feisty. It's got a great dialogue in there. Had some wonderful stories that have already started coming out of it. You know, just in our first few months of play here, a couple partnerships have formed. Had a, a frontline employee use the techniques learned in that community, and just last week he was promoted into a, a managerial role. Ooh, awesome. Uh, yeah, we've had uh, people from Africa and Australia just ask for help on some CX fundamentals. And within minutes, uh, people from five or six different countries just jumping on to help these individuals. It has been thrilling to watch that happen. So very excited to see that virtual community grow. And then, too, we have just a set of uh, unique resources that are really geared towards helping new CX professionals get into the game and find a solid foothold to get started well. Nice. And tell me about, tell me, tell me what was your inspiration for creating CX Accelerator? I just love, love, love this work. You know, I I came into customer service with just such a a tornado of passion and just loving the, the idea of serving these customers and working through their problems. But then, I mean, with an even greater tenacity, I was able to dive into customer experience realizing, wait, so I don't have to sit on the phone and wait for people to call me. I can actually help solve problems upstream and design better experiences so they don't even have an issue. And it was just like a tidal wave of thought of Hmm. this is the most exciting thing in my career. So I I feel like customer experience was custom made for for me just in terms of what I enjoy doing. And it it has been thrilling these past couple of years to, to fail hard and succeed well and just everything in between. Absolutely. You know, I heard someone uh, say, I think it was yesterday, somebody told me my favorite part about uh, customer experience and voice of customer platforms is that the customer talks back. Hmm. So it's it's that one place where you get back from the customer what you're putting out. You I can love hear that. their perceptions. Yeah, it was, it, was it, it stuck with me. It was pretty brilliant. Um, other than CX Accelerator, Tell me about the other projects that you're developing. Actually, let's let's go on to the CX Accelerator website, sure. which is it kind of, I guess, the evolution of the Slack uh, channel <laughs> and, and kind True. of where that went. Yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of my own evolution. And I kind of laugh. You know, I have some veterans that are alongside me for this journey, Annette Franz and Sue Duris and 
Nancy Port uh, that have consulted me and helped me along the way. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm only three years into this work. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I am, uh, as Paul the Apostle would state, I am still drinking milk and am not yet ready for red meat. And uh, <laughs> so it, it's kind of like as you watch CX Accelerator grow, it's almost like that's me. Like that's me currently. That's my capabilities. That's my understanding. Like I have a long way to go in terms of my capabilities in this. And hopefully, I hope, as you see CX Accelerator mature, and just the the tone of voice there and the the maturity of that site that that also means that I am maturing as well. <laughs> but we will see. <laughs> yeah, that, don't hold your breath exactly. for that maturity there. <laughs> that goes. But you know, I think in that sense, I feel a lot of um, maybe camaraderie with you, Nate, because I'm also a, a, a newly a, a new arrival to to the CX world. And and do you think that maybe the the reason both you and I our channels have have made such an impact is because there is a bit of freshness, maybe a little bit of outside perspective. We don't, we're not kind of stuck in, in the habits of, of previous uh, generations of customer experience. What do you think? I think there's some truth to that. I mean, I think for you, in your case, you just have a, a great, compelling, refreshing personality and a dynamic voice. So I, I think that oh, is very much you. to your credit. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you, when you marry, you know, your your great methodology around surveys and what you're doing to help the industry, I, I think that's just a win-win there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think you know there is this concept within, I guess you could almost call it legacy customer experience. Of uh, here's this set of best practices. Here's what customer experience was as it gained its foundation in in the the corporate world. If we look back, I mean, CXPA was founded, I think, in 2011. Right. This is not an old concept, and it is evolving so fast. And I think the reality is that people are confused because the old rules don't apply anymore. I mean, everybody's mm-hmm. now in the wake of digital transformation, and, and the, the game has changed. The rules are different. So... I mean, these these legacy players, these veteran people have so much knowledge to bring to the current state of business. But at the same time, you have to have that agility and that flexibility to be able to operate in, in today's reality. And that's a hard mix to find. So I think those that are really excelling in the space are those that have the, the openness and the flexibility to not cater to the old but to learn from and, and steal from the old, but then interject new creativity into all of it. And, and I like yeah. to think that's what, where me and you are, are hopefully finding our voice. Well, you know, for me, sometimes it, it blows me away a little bit, especially when I'm, you know, podcasting with these amazing folks that are, have got so much experience and I've got nothing. And they're brilliant. You know, on Tuesday, I was talking to Shep Hyken and I'm sitting here at my mic thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm talking to Shep Hyken, <laughs> you know? know, and kind of fangirling him in that sense. Yep. And that's one thing that we cannot fall into the trap of is thinking that people that came from a previous generation know less than us. It's actually so very much the opposite. And then we've got so much to learn. And it reminds me of uh, when I was reading Phil Klaus's book, Measuring Customer Experience, the first to uh, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 pages is CX history. And he goes like all the way back to to the beginning of the 20th century. And he talks about how customer experience has evolved. And at the end, he says, you can skip this if you want. But what he's, you know, what he's trying to promote with that is you don't have to go back and start from scratch. So many brilliant minds before you. Yeah brought us up to this point right here. So you need to start from the point where they left off and not from zero. And I, that for me was an eye opener because we don't have to try to start from scratch. We have to pick up where others left off. Yeah. Right. And and that's, I think what our mission should be, right? No, it's well stated. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same with anything. I mean, if, if we can learn from our forefathers and foremothers of this industry, but also be able to interject a new fresh breath into it, then, then we should be successful. And, and I, I hope that for everyone. Worthix is disrupting the market research industry with cutting edge technology and a revolutionary methodology. Visit worthix.com to learn how we're using artificial intelligence to improve customer experience at companies like Verizon, Jeep, 
Blizzard, HP and L'Oreal. Well, let's get into the, the, the kind of technical aspect of what you do a little bit. I wanted to talk about surveys because surveys is something that you and I have discussed a lot. And it's still, as, as time goes by, the voice of the customer is still as important as ever. But uh, a lot of people have strong opinions about how we should collect the voice of customer. Um, so I wanted to hear your point of view on that, where you feel it's going and how you propose that we should do that. Yeah, what a great topic. Voice of customer is just awesome. I mean, it is how we get smarter so that as we dive in and try to make changes, we can do it intelligently and in a way that's actually going to impact the customer experience. So I've, I've loved this, uh, this whole philosophy, this methodology around voice of customer. Annette France has been so helpful in my journey here. Uh, so thank you to her. Uh, but I mean, in the area of surveys, I feel like I've just had a major come about. <laughs> and you'll probably laugh, Mary, because I know we've talked a few times about this before. You know, I was on this war path like a year and a half ago, like against surveys. Like mm -hmm. customers have evolved beyond them. Surveys are out of date. They're not helpful. People aren't filling them out. And those that are, the, the quality of data represented there is, is not good. It's not helpful. So, I mean, how do we just kill this? And so I went, <laughs> I went to downtown Nashville with a friend to film a little video for CX Accelerator in which the question, just a man on the street type of video, the question was, how likely are you to fill out a survey? And we were sure mm -hmm. that we would get the definitive and overwhelming response that I never fill out surveys and they're dumb. Mm -hmm. And we're, it was almost like I was trying to lead it that way. I was on an agenda to, to have that be the response. Did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> People still, it's still a very valuable and viable channel. And the shocking thing was, as we were asking really young people, like millennials and younger, like how likely are you to fill out a survey? A significant percentage of them were saying, oh, every time, of course I fill out the survey. My, my voice is important. <laughs> right. And it's always the like, empowered customer. It really is. I mean, it's just, uh, and I, I like to think that maybe one thing that has happened is that our ability as an industry of CX professionals to solicit feedback through surveys has improved versus what it was 10 years ago with these long formatted laborious surveys that were not accessible, not a good UI experience at all. The survey experience itself was very poor. And so I think an, an outcome of the fact that these younger brands, these these generational brands that are really catering to these people, they have great CX professionals, great voice of customer programs. They're soliciting feedback in a way that's more meaningful. And this generation of customers is responding well to that. So it made me realize, huh, you know, it's time to time to reevaluate my viewpoint on this and not be on a war path against surveys but rather to be on a war path against bad surveys. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. There is still a chance that we may still ruin the next generation. <laughs> sure. still a possibility. It is. There was, there was some, some research done about that, about how uh, older people were less likely to dedicate time to answering surveys. And refresh, help me refresh my, my mind on this. Was it, I think it was, did you, did you see this research? I did not. Yeah, it was it was something like uh, boomers and older generations have less faith in change. So they have less faith that the feedback they give is going to have any impact whatsoever in the quality of the product or service. So they don't answer surveys because they don't have any faith in surveys. Yeah. And I think that this is because the old way of doing surveys, not only was it horribly boring, and, and it involved a huge amount of effort on behalf of the customer, but very little sprung as a result for all the effort that they were putting into answering it, yeah. right? And to your point, maybe the, the younger generations, it, it comes more organically and more naturally because we have evolved so much in actually taking action on the results of survey and big data and uh, natural language processing and text analyses that that is able to now condense and actually generate reports and insight from voice of customer surveys now. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're nailing it. That's exactly right. And that is, I think the hope for all of us, as far as where this whole ship is sailing, I, I feel like we need to become less dependent on surveys one 
as far as we our approach to managing customer feedback and, and VOC, I just I see such an opportunity within the unstructured data area in terms of this feedback that's coming to us that does not fit the channel of the survey. It is equally as important and it cannot be disregarded and we have to put in the effort to capture that. And then also, I mean, there's these other structured channels too. I mean, I, I definitely would consider surveys to be a structured channel. Like we've created mm -hmm. a place for customers to speak to us. So we right. made that channel. It's structured. But I mean, another structured channel that's, that's just surging right now is automated data collection. I mean, we it's amazing what we can see and find out about our customers through that AI and through that automation. I mean, that's another structured channel there. So, I mean, if, if we become overly dependent on surveys for our customer feedback management, then we miss these other huge components. Right. And do you think that this mentality of yours came from your experience with call centers? No. Uh, I think that it's because I'm in a high tech space and my customers do not fill out surveys very often. Mm -hmm. And it has forced me to evolve and adapt to get the valuable customer feedback that I crave. So how do you do it? So as far as the unstructured data that's coming in, just verbatim or over email or other things, so we have what I have uh, conveniently coined the CX magic button. Mm -hmm. It is just a, a button that goes to a link. It's and just a it, web key, right? It is. It's a USB web key. Uh, but it's been really, really successful in terms of employees recognizing that little physical device on their desk and associating that with their responsibility to be the voice of the customer. Because our customers love to talk to us. We're on the phone with them a lot, within sales, within support, within finance, all the touch points. We're talking to our customers on a regular basis, and they're providing us feedback verbatim and over email. And that is where we're getting the highest quality and quantity of feedback in our, in our space. So these little USB web key buttons, they just simply take you to an ultra simplified voice of customer feedback form and you plug it right in. It's just asking, where is the customer in their journey? <laughs> what, what are they trying to do? What do they need right now? And what happened? And none of that's even required. You know, we're just enabling our employees to whatever they can capture around that meaningful customer feedback. And that's the, the guide rail that we've given to our employees is anytime you get meaningful customer feedback, good or bad, that's where this belongs. And then we have them capture just a form of sediment, anything from very happy down to very frustrated in regards to that specific experience that they're having. It has been a treasure trove of data that has been coming in from all over the org and driving a far more robust dialogue in our voice of customer meetings and our journey maps have come alive with this information it's very compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as formatted. It's not as easy to take it and throw it into a, a perfect dashboard as you would have with survey data, but it brings a whole nother piece of the pie in terms of the customer perception. And it has fueled these dialogues in a way where, I mean, the, the surveys were missing it. They were missing a part of the picture. Mm -hmm. So in, in no way, I mean, the surveys are still very valuable, it's almost like they hold one another accountable in some ways. Like you have the survey data that's coming in, then you can compare that to all your unstructured data. And, and then also in many ways, you can bring it both together and get that full picture. It's been very powerful. Right. And let me ask you something. Um, how do you process this raw data? Since you can't you know, fit in the same dashboards like that you do with a survey where you'd have these structured questions and everything. How do you process that? Because I can see that working maybe on a ma like a manual level with a, a couple hundred, maybe even a couple thousand responses, even there it starts getting challenging. Yep. But once you get higher than that in bigger organizations and enterprises, et cetera, how can, how can people process all this information, all this data? Yep, that's fair. So for us, we've, we've maintained a level of flexibility with it mm -hmm. um, that might not work for some very large enterprise level organizations that really need the clear, consistent output. For us, we, we tag it and bag it. You know, we're able to, to manually review. I mean, some of it's automated. We know where they are in the journey because we asked for that information. We know how happy they are. Um, so then it's just a matter of, okay, well, let's put it here under this touch point. We've captured the heart of the statement that the customer is saying. We now have that sediment 
variable, that right there plugs into a journey map, at least our journey maps. Right. I mean, that's one very valuable output right there. But the biggest thing is we're just we're just taking the trends in the heart of it. We're we're curating that in advance of what we call our customer first meeting. And we're just talking through the feedback that's coming in. I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that what we're all trying to do with our dashboards and reports and other things is generate a robust dialogue? Absolutely. So in many ways, we're just shortcutting right to there in terms of here's the feedback that's come in. Here's where we're identifying the trends. We've got to talk through this. And we've got accountability built right into that voice of customer meeting, that that format to where all right, here's what's going on. You own this one. By next week, please have an update ready to go. Let's keep serving customers better and better over time. And it has helped. Right. And let me ask you something. How does that, how do you relay this information to the decision makers in the company, the C-suite, the people who actually have the power to create structural changes in the company? So we have a change coalition to steal from John Calder leading change. We have our change coalition of this area that it meets weekly for that customer first meeting. So we, we've got a critical mass right in there consuming this information on a regular basis. And then as far as the C-suite, they're included on all the action items that are coming out of there. Mm -hmm. So they know what we're working on and what's going on. And then we have created some dashboards that effectively marry our survey data in conjunction with our unstructured data. They're very simplistic, but they're maps that show here's where the sediment is in these different touch point areas. Here's a lot of the verbatims. I mean, people want to know what is the customer actually saying? So we're associating those touch point statements with, with the different areas. And so we're, we're collecting that and offering that not just to the C-suite because <laughs> they like to consume and ask some questions and some things. But the game changer for us, and I stole this shamelessly from Eventbrite, a software company in Nashville, <laughs> Tennessee. Thank you to Allison, the VOC manager over there. She does these fantastic voice of customer forums with her entire employee population. Wow. It's just an open forum. And you get, to, you get to hear recorded customer calls. You see all the data that's coming in to the listening path channels and through the surveys. You have that that you're reviewing together. You're seeing where the customer's getting stuck, where the call's coming in. And, I mean, any other compelling opportunities to ultimately bridge the gap between a developer, an IT professional, an accounts payable person, bridge the gap between that employee and the life of the customer. That's where stuff happens. In your customer first meeting, is that almost like a, a board meeting where you have re like a representative of different departments in the, in, within the organization? Correct. Absolutely. That's great for breaking down silos, I would yeah. imagine. And it's, it's that peer-to-peer -peer accountability too. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. you've got to look yeah. each other in the face and be like, hey, this is, this is not going well. There's an opportunity here and we got to work together to get this solved. Well, and also rallying everyone uh, together against a common enemy, right? And getting everybody on board to fight bad service. We we talk about that on this podcast all the time with, you know, gamification and other things that you can do where you just get everybody involved so that there's that sense of accountability, right? Where it's not like, oh, well, that's not my department. When you have everyone working together, it creates a a, a greater good sense in people where then they, you know, champion for the customer, right? You have to have that. If, if that culture does not exist in the organization, it is almost meaningless mm. for you at that point to be soliciting customer feedback because you will be paralyzed to do anything with it. So, I mean, you, first you got to lay the foundation of helping people to care <laughs> that customers exist and that we all have the responsibility of serving them better. And one of the things that we did when we took our button system, instead of just sending out an email and saying, you have this weird box on your desk, we went department by department, small group by small group, and we met with the employees individually to build that groundswell and to educate them specifically. Here's your job. Here's you. Here's why customer feedback matters. Here's why this mm -hmm. is important. Here's the touch point that you influence, and here's where it is on a journey map. You have impact here. You can serve our customers well, and we're, we're here to serve you. And I mean, and that was what tipped the momentum in our favor in terms of people actually using the buttons and taking the time to put meaningful customer feedback in. You have to make it relevant to the individual.
If you want to understand more about the science behind customer decisions, follow our blog at blog.worthix.com or find Worthix on your favorite social media. Getting your CX project off the ground? Start with the right foot by downloading our CX guides, ebooks, and playbooks on worthix.com today. I'm going to take a step back into the data that you collect through this uh, unstructured uh, channel. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to apply or create KPIs? Like, okay, you can say, you know, KPIs might not be relevant, but for, for people who are used to working with them, you no longer have those specific answers to those specific questions like NPS, like customer effort score, like CSAT, like um, all of these other things. You no longer have that data. Yeah. Uh, do you miss it? Well, we do have that data. And, and I should have made it more clear originally. I apologize. So the, the unstructured aspect in no way cannibalizes from your traditional structured channels. Hmm. So you have everything that we used to have in terms of those data points. The surveys are still going out. They're still coming back as many as we can get. And we're establishing those key fundamental points of NPS, customer effort score, customer satisfaction. But where, where the opportunity is, I mean, this feedback is already coming in. Like customers are telling us every day, here's how I feel about you. Here's my perception of your brand. And historically, it just wasn't being captured or considered at all because the channel didn't exist to capture it. <laughs> so it's just adding this whole next level component where we extend the value of the voice of customer program beyond those static KPIs. Right. Well, that's getting me thinking here. Here I am in, in my mind, you know, processing everything you're saying and so all of this information that customers have been dying to tell us, but they can't because the channel that we provide them to speak to us is structured in this way where they're only allowed to either give a number or max, they have one open end, you know, one comment section where they try to basically vomit out everything they feel. And then that's, that doesn't relate to KPI or a metric at all. Exactly. So. In that case, how important is it for us to still have KPIs if what we're getting is basically the customer telling us exactly what he or she wants in a very direct, straightforward manner? Is it still necessary to have all the other KPIs? We, we should have all that we can have. Okay. So, I mean, there, there are still – I mean, you just got to think about – I mean, you as a consumer, Mary, I mean, when you're out there in the world – and all of a sudden, you've had an event occur where you would just darn well love to give feedback to a brand. Mm -hmm. What are the odds that you've got a survey sitting in front of you in an accessible enough way to where you're going to be able to go in there? And then, too, that survey is going to be flexible enough and dynamic enough where it really captures the heart and emotion that you're having. So I mean, there's a lot of variables that have to fall into place there. Does it happen? Yes, it does. And we should maximize the number of times that that does happen. But for everything else, <laughs> when that customer does not have that survey sitting in front of them and they're giving us that feedback in another way, or if, if that channel is too structured to where we can't just get the heart and mind of that customer, that's where we need the freedom of this unstructured approach. Hmm. Do you get data like, I feel frustrated or I feel annoyed? Yes. Do you get that expression of, of sentiment? Absolutely. Like I'm, I'm here thinking if, if, if I'm answering a customer satisfaction thing and I'm not satisfied, if the company asked me right after I, you know, I, I gave him a low score, if they asked me, well, how did this make you feel? You know, like what caused this event and how did this make you feel? Uh huh. Is there anyone asking that question? Do people ask that question? Is, is, is the sentiment lost when it comes to these KPIs? I don't know. I darn well hope so. I mean, I have the hilarious incident that I had sitting in a chicken restaurant. I won't reveal the brand because I absolutely adore them and I don't want to be doing any, any brand bashing here. But I'm sitting there and like I had a receipt that I had filled out to get a free sandwich. Mm -hmm. I, I took a survey. So there we go. I did it. And so I got, I got a free sandwich. Well, I happen to know because I have spent way too much money in this restaurant that if I spent like 27 cents that I could upgrade my free sandwich to a deluxe version. 
which oh. is required mm -hmm. to get that cheese, lettuce, and tomato. Got to have that. Okay. Um, so I went up to the register to, to follow this workflow, and uh, I was told no, that I could only have the free basic sandwich and that there was no upgrade capability. <laughs> so I, okay, you know, I wasn't going to throw a fit or a full tantrum right then. So I took my basic sandwich and went back and started eating it. My wife and my kiddos are, they're having to use the restroom as is somehow having two daughters is always the case. Uh, but, but they come out and my wife goes through the line with the exact same scenario mm. of having a feedback receipt uh, for a free chicken sandwich. She asked the same question of, can I upgrade this for X amount of cents? And she's given a deluxe sandwich. What? Oh, and I'm just like, what the heck? Like, I mean, she's just a much better person than I am. So the the universe gives her a, a better response, but <laughs> it's also not fair. And so I'm sitting here brooding, eating my my unsufficient sandwich. And then as luck would have it, a person comes out of the corner wearing a shirt of this restaurant, holding an iPad, ready to solicit my feedback. Oh, look at <laughs> oh that. I mean, what are the odds, right? And she is reading these questions of, was the restaurant clean? Do you like your food today? And I, I went through. So then the moment comes where uh, I, I don't even think she prompted it, but I'm like, hey, so this just happened. And I'm a little peeved right now. And I, I really like a deluxe sandwich. I mean, just fully assured that she was going to do the right thing and go fix it. I mean, for $2, she can go back there and fix the problem, and it's over. Mm -hmm. She just goes completely white, having no ability or, or way to put this, this unstructured feedback into her little iPad mm -hmm. format. Right. <laughs> she literally just, just walks away back into her corner. And like, that's the end of the... So she <laughs> lost the most valuable information and not her fault at all, right? But I mean... Exactly. The company will never know. Right. They don't know. They don't care because it wasn't on their, their formatted survey. And she didn't have the ability to think outside of that structure that had been created for her. So it's like, right. man, look what, we've, look what we've done to ourselves. The idea around voice of customer is that we hear, that we listen to what's happening and we make it better. <laughs> and we lose track of that in favor of our KPIs, which is not right. Yeah. Huh. Oh, well, there's so much to get into in that. I'm going to talk about one last thing that I saw on the CX Accelerator website, mm -hmm. which is your three steps for customer experience. I mean, I, I understand that three steps seems very, very simple, and I'm pretty sure there are a lot more steps to that, but it's basically three concepts, right? <laughs> yeah. So, Tell me about those three steps and, and where you came up with that concept and because I think it's really valuable and I think it's a great place to start. Yeah, I mean, it, it came from research, looking at Tepkin, looking at CXPA, looking at Gartner and Forrester and trying to take out the core of these different models and what people are saying so that somebody can just have a clear starting point. Because that, I mean, we think in threes, <laughs> whether we like it or not, three is just a very mm -hmm. pleasing number to the human mind. It's something we can retain and digest. And I do coincidentally feel as though the heart of customer experience, at least the starting point, falls into three areas. Number one being that employee experience. We are going to mirror the experience that we are having as an employee to the customers. It cannot be faked and it has to be there. And as Simon Sinek says, employees, if they love a company, customers will love that company. It, it cannot be faked. So, I mean, that is the foundation. And then you move into your voice of customer engine. As Jean Bliss would say, I love Chief Customer Officer 2.0. And mm -hmm. I mean, she has this concept of creating these listening paths and developing a true voice of customer engine. That's how you get smart. That's how you be able to view every problem and situation and new product and service from the lens of the customer. It's impossible to operate without that perspective. And every change you make, every new service you introduce, it has to be tested and validated through that voice of customer channel. So, I mean, that, that's just such a critical component of this. And then you have the experience engineering, which is hopping back into another testament book of CX, which is the effortless experience by the corporate executive board, now Gartner. And that is using best practices to ultimately make the changes that will maximize ROI and serve customers the very best. Now that you've gotten smarter, 
through your voice of customer engine, now that your employees are very happy and can deliver on an experience that makes sense and that will be helpful, now it's time to design and create that experience. And there's a whole bunch of methodologies and tools and practices within that. So, I mean, Mary, that's how I feel like, at least in my mind, again, I've been doing this work for a couple of years. There's a lot I don't know, but so far, those are the buckets in my mind, and that's where you start. And the last one where you were talking about experience engineering, I mean, I guess that's that's where the designing journey maps come in. Uh, is that where you can maybe add some peak end rule um, concepts of surprise and delight? Is Is that what we're talking about when we're talking about experience engineering? I would say so. Journey maps is going to be an extension of your voice of customer stage. That's an output of the information that you're getting through your customer feedback program. Your experience engineering stage, I mean, this is where you have, and I'm a Lean Six Sigma green belt. So I, I default to DMAIC, <laughs> define, measure, implement, analyze, control. Right. So now that I've learned, we have this problem, everyone, and we've learned it through our customer feedback. How can we design? Now, a better experience that's going to be frictionless, that's going to result in a great uh, journey touchpoint across the board for these customers, and what's the methodologies that we can use together to make that happen? I love DMAIC. I love Lean Six Sigma principles because I believe it results in a very frictionless experience and just an intelligent experience at the end of the line, but there are so many other methodologies that could be applied within that stage depending on what it is you know a kaizen phrase that is brilliant is just do it <laughs> you know if there's a, a trend that comes out of your voc programs that is just so compelling and obvious and easy then just just go solve it don't projectize it don't operationalize it over the course of months just go fix it and then see if that touch point through your voc program improves but for most other things, you're going to have to take a step back. You're going to have to form some type of a project team of some kind and go through whatever it is, DevOps, Agile, value stream mapping, cause and effect diagrams, Lean Six Sigma Prints, whatever it is that makes sense in your organization, you've got to apply those practices and those methodologies to design a better experience. Awesome. Nate, amazing. I loved it. It was everything I was hoping for. Good. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, how can our listeners be a part of what you're doing? Yeah, come and find me on Twitter. I'm at customer is first. And then please, please, please go to cxaccelerator.com. We finally just got to the point where if you misspell CX Accelerator, it will still pop up on Google. So <laughs> huge milestone for us. SEO works. <laughs> awesome. Amazing. Okay, so cxaccelerator.com. Is it that simple? Yep. And then please jump in our community. There's a community page right on the top and we'd love to see you in Slack. I mean, that's how we continue this dialogue. That's how we get smarter together is by just asking questions and being transparent with each other and wrestling through this stuff. And as CX continues to evolve, as it will, it will be different next week. Let's do it together. Absolutely. And if you go on there and you start talking about uh, NPS, Mary will probably come and argue with you. So, I mean. I'll get your back, though, because I'm still an NPS fan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Nate. I uh, appreciate you coming on. I hope we get to talk to you uh, several more times in the, in the near future. Indeed. It's my pleasure, Mary. And thank you for putting on this great show. Thank you for listening to Voices of Customer Experience. If you'd like to hear more or get a full podcast summary, visit the episode details page or go to blog.worthix.com slash podcasts. This episode of Voices of Customer Experience was hosted and produced by Mary Drummond, co-hosted by James Conrad and edited by Nick Gomez. Blog copy and summary by Emma Waldron. <laughs>